Good afternoon, everyone, and you are very welcome to today's Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar series. My name is Kira Stagg, I'm the Alumni Relations Officer here at Trinity Development and Alumni, and it is such a rainy and wet day in Dublin. I hope wherever you are in the world tuning in that it's really sunny there. Today's webinar is all about recovering history, the Beyond 2022 project and the virtual record treasury of Ireland. Now, before we get started and introduce our speakers, um, I would just like to say a few things. This webinar will be just under an hour. It'll run for 40 minutes and we'll have a virtual tour and discussion followed by audience Q&A. To participate in the Q&A, and we really hope you will, just click at the bottom button on the screen, which says Q&A, and you can pop a question in whenever you think of it throughout the webinar. We are using Zoom generated automatic subtitles today and to access them, all you need to do is click the three dots at the bottom of the screen and click view full transcript. We are recording today's webinar and it'll be available for future playback on the Trinity Alumni YouTube channel. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our speakers. Kieran Wallace is the Deputy Director of Beyond 2022, the research project which created the Virtual Record Treasury of Ireland. He completed his PhD on Dublin's complicated municipal politics before independence at Trinity College Dublin in 2010. He has lectured in John Paul Dublin, in, he had lectured in Dublin City University, Liverpool John Moores University and Trinity College Dublin. Kieran has published on Dublin politics, social history and political Irish cartoons. He has been involved with the Beyond 2022 project since its inception in 2016. Peter Crooks is founding director of Beyond 2022 and association professor and senior lecturer in medieval history at Trinity College Dublin. He's published widely on the history of Ireland and Britain in the new Middle Ages and is editor of the new Cambridge History of Britain, volume 2, 1100 to 1500. And Peter is also a member of the Irish Manuscripts Commission, Friends of Medieval Dublin and is chair of the Irish Baroque Orchestra. Now, without further ado, sit back, relax and enjoy your tour. Thanks very much, Kira. Thanks, Kira. And uh, lovely to speak to all of you on this very wet day in Dublin. And we will be taking you on a virtual tour where one thing we can promise, if the technology works, uh, you won't get soaked, uh, unlike at the actual walking tour that we might want to take you on another occasion. Um, I'm Peter Crooks. Kira Wallace is my very close colleague. Hi, everyone. And we're going to introduce you to this centenary project beyond 2022, which uh, began at Trinity uh, about six years ago, a project to reconstruct virtually the Public Record Office of Ireland, which was, as we'll tell you, Ireland's first uh, national level archive, first attempt to create a repository centrally that could accumulate all the records of government in the island. And it was completely destroyed or almost completely destroyed 100 years ago. Uh, in June 1922. And what we're going to introduce you to is uh, the Public Record Office of Ireland as a lost archive that has been recreated. We're going to describe what happened a century ago or just over a century ago. And we'll also look a little bit into the future because what has happened uh, in the last six years is a new uh, virtual uh, repository has been created for the first time through partnership at national level, regional level, local level, international level. And it's a new public resource. I hope many of you are already using it, but if you haven't used it before today, I hope it's the first thing you'll do after the, the webinar session. That will be a sign that we've done our job. <laughs> so we'll be, we'll be taking you uh, into the future in, in more ways than one. So I, I should share now, and Karen and I are gonna do this together. Very I'm good. actually mostly the driver. And so Karen... so um, we're keeping you out, out of the rain. You might not get your steps in on this tour, but we'll keep you dry. Um, so uh, this is the our virtual reconstruction of the Public Record Office of Ireland. So to kind of orientate you, you're in the Four Courts complex on the Quays in Dublin. This building is just one step back from the Quays on the junction of Church Street and sort of the Lewis line at the Broadstone. We'll, we'll position it later on. We'll show you some photographs which line it up. Yeah. And the building you see is a purpose-built archive opened in 1867. It was very exciting, very modern, designed to be an archive, designed to be fireproof. And if you see, there's sort of two sections to the building. The front section, which has the chimneys, is the administration block. And that's where the archival workers were. It's where the public reading room was, lit by gas, by gas lamps and heated by open coal fires. So this was a place of risk of fire. And every archivist was always terrified of fire. So Can I open this up here? And so that you oh, actually do. Yeah, so that, that'll split that, open. That glass roof there is 
bring the down in, lights down into the reading room, so the reading room. So, what, and you can see the chamber what you're seeing this a slice through the building here so the front part there is where people did the readings uh, so they went to consult the records and that uh, that was the building that had all the the, the busy bee workers if you like the rear building with That's where you see all here. the white grid work is yeah. the record treasury and they are all open metal walkways stairways metal shelving deliberately choosing metal so that it's not going to catch fire wherever they use timber they use deliberately fire retardant timber and the whole concept was to reduce the risk of fire getting into this building so a huge glass roof for natural light 10 enormous tell 10 enormous arched windows down each side and most there. likely of all there's the windows there thank you between the two buildings uh is yep. this fire gap so this is a break yep. a, 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 that's yeah, the perfect. section here isn't it yeah that's exactly it. Um, so that between the two buildings, so if you were sitting in the reading room to the front and you ordered a record, the archival staff went through the fire gap into a separate building, fetched the record back to you and brought it to you in the reading desk. This, this is the tunnel. That's like the communication tunnel between the two, isn't that right? And it's, yeah, it's kind of like a, a lightweight tunnel so that in the event of a fire in the front building, which is what they expected, they could pull down the tunnel very quickly, close the airlock doors, if you like, into the treasury. And there you had everything secure in the back building and the record treasury. And they did call it a treasury. So they regarded the records of Ireland as treasures. And they always refer to that building as the record treasury. So... 1867, this opens, they start bringing in records from all around Ireland and all around Dublin into that treasury. They're shelving them, they're writing catalogue entries for them, <clears throat> they're conserving them, tidying them up and so forth. The rear part of the building is what is destroyed. The arch window bit is what's destroyed. The front block with the camera, with the chimneys is ironically the bit that was badly damaged, but survived and is now today the Court of Appeal. So we'll come back to that, uh, we'll sort of meet that later in the tour. So in our VR model here, you can go onto the website, click around, work your way around the building, but we've built in these hot spots. So if you see these blue targets around, and, and these light are up, yeah. light up as you, as you hover, and they're to like, give you little information points about the building. So we'll just show you one or two of those. Um, yes, you picked that from Peter then, uh, yeah. please. So the what's building happening itself, here? Yeah, Eastern 1922, you need to take us back into that moment. So it's been operating for 55 years. We're coming to 1922. The War of Independence is finished. The Anglo-Irish Treaty has been signed. The delegates, Michael Collins and Arthur Griffiths and co, have come back from London with the treaty and the Doyle has split over pro and anti-treaty sides. The anti-treaty forces at Christmas at Easter 1922 have occupied the four courts. And for 10 weeks from April 1922 until the end of June, it's like a standoff. They yeah. have barricaded themselves inside. What you're seeing here is... These two young lads aren't the actual anti-treaty no. forces. <laughs> These are... To show, actually, it's just showing you actually socially that the occupation went on for so long that kids in the area were playing soldiers outside the gates. This yeah. gate, I think, is onto the Chancery Lane side. So this yeah. is on the so east people side. People be familiar with those gates from driving along the Liffey. If you haven't passed Chancery yeah. Lane, it's a similar kind of, that's the four courts you know, as opposed to the public record office, which is a bit hidden behind. People tend to miss it. But exactly so. There. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then after the 10 weeks, you have this business of uh, the, the um, uh, sorry, well, during the 10 weeks, if you go on to just the next image there, yeah. the next photograph in this deck shows what I think is the final photograph ever taken of the Public Record Office. Here you have uh, Joe McHenry, who's one of the um, anti-treaty occupying uh, garrison, and he's standing on the roof of the old Four Courts building, and behind his knees, if you see down the lower part of the image, are yeah, the yeah. arched windows of the Record Treasury. Yeah. So this is during the 10-week occupation, and there's some wonderful photographs on the website of the anti-treaty occupying garrison there, uh, and sort of life going on over the 10 weeks. He, do you reckon time. he's on the dome? Is that... I, I think he's standing it. back. I think the cameraman has his back to the dome. Yeah. And yeah. I think McHenry is standing near the, more closer than I would stand to the parapet, but he's closing, <laughs> standing sure. close to the end. And he's looking down kind of north and west. So that might be St. Mickens, if anybody knows the geography. Here. Yeah, exactly and so. This would be the today the red Lewis line going from Jervis Street uh, west. Up to Houston, Houston, yeah. yeah. All right. So that's so that kind of positions it. So we've got the river to behind the cameraman, if you like, and John McHenry's back is towards St. Mickens Church and yeah. sort of Smithfield and that kind of area. Okay. Um, so uh, this is just an example of, like, the, you, there's text there to read to tell you the story of what's going on with the occupation. But you can work your way right around the building. And mm -hmm. if you keep walking around, um, and it's you can see the daylight coming through. Uh, yeah, thunder coming through the window at the moment, which is appropriate because it sounds yes. like an <laughs> okay. explosion, which is the next bit of the story. Yes. For, for those listening overseas, we're having a very stormy day in Dublin. Yeah, This is the explosion. So this is the, the on the 28th of June, the battle began for the four courts. On the 30th of June, a huge explosion um, oh, uh, yeah. of... There's thunder going again. Here. A huge explosion going in, uh, blew up the forecourt of the 
uh, four courts buildings, the courtyard of the courthouse buildings, and it it demolished the side wall of the record treasury, and it threw up this huge cloud of smoke. So that cloud you see, that mushroom cloud, it cast centuries of records, like 700 years of records up into the sky. Many of them blew away on the wind, got as far as Hoth Head and so forth. And uh, the level of destruction was really enormous. You'll see here in this next image that Peter's going to show, that is the scene in the inner courtyard of the four courts looks at the destruction of the tall arched windows and you can see all that metal framework inside is melted and what I always imagined happened was because it's metal framework as the heat got more intense as the explosive material was thrown in amongst the records and the fire became an inferno that they they sort of the, melt, the metal shelves melted and began tipping records yeah. down into yeah. the central atrium creating like a self-feeding furnace nearly yeah and uh you can see here too that one arch in the arcade of windows has completely collapsed and i suppose that some of the rubble not all of it that we're seeing here but yeah. we know that they only managed to clear this material here through the autumn i think there were labor strikes weren't there that summer they, were, they, yeah, didn't, they didn't manage to war, clear yeah. this immediately so not only is it fire but anything that was ex you know blasted out of the building into this masonry here was then affected by the rain and uh but it is kind of a miraculous fact and we can touch on it later again that within the rubble there were fragmentary records which have been preserved for a century and just in the last couple of years it's very exciting have been opened up and almost miraculously conserved by our colleagues in the national archives of Oregon. I mean that that story alone of what they found and they took out they they had burnt and charred records and twisted bound books and medieval rolls they wrapped them in, literally wrapped them in cotton wool brown paper parcels string them tied them up with string labeled them as best they could and put them away on shelves for well for 100 years really so it's been a very exciting part of the project that particular strand of work has been really exciting so that's what went wrong so what what were we doing uh i mean ostensibly the whole idea was completely mad but uh we wanted to recreate for the centenary about six years before the centenary uh, I was locked in a room uh, with some other colleagues and told to come up with an idea and this was the idea I had I had no idea where it was going to lead to it's one of those uh, moments where uh, you know quote unquote blue sky thinking really led to something useful uh, I hope and the, there was the sense that the centenary was coming down the track this was going to be a very significant moment and we need to do something concerted about it. And it did just seem to animate an awful lot of uh, uh, partnerships and uh, extra extraordinary generosity from a number of uh, institutions, including the TCD Trust, uh, just to acknowledge the work of the Trust, yeah. which gave us very early on the seed funding to do the first iteration of this uh, virtual model that we're about to enter. So uh, you listening uh, have probably contributed to this uh, model uh, through your support of the trust work and the alumni credit card. Will we go inside? Do less please get out of the rain. Okay. Um, so we're following these green way markers. Now you can do this yourselves at home after the yeah. show if you like. So, you know, this is just a, a quick scope through. There's lots more you can see yourselves. If you go through into the entrance stairway, I think this is nice, <coughs> excuse me, because it shows you kind of the architecture of the building. And this so, is still here, just to remind people, like you yep, can, this you, if you happen to have a case at the Court of Appeal, uh, you would get to see this uh, very, very uh, in intricate piece of architecture. I'm going to click on this, Kieran, just to give a sense of as it is today. And these are, in fact, bullet wounds, are they not? Yes, they are. Yep. So this is the, the fighting was at such close quarters during the uh, siege and occupation at the end of the of June 22, that these are bullet, bullet marks coming through the window, the front window, which is behind the photographer here, and they're hitting the interior windows, the back wall of the interior windows there, sort of bullet wounds and other damage. Um, but we'll see even greater damage later on in photographs. But so the building is very much a, a living relic. But there's the details, <coughs> excuse me, like th this architectural drawing we see here, this is part of what enabled us to make the virtual reality model. Some very few photographs and then some wonderful uh, uh, architectural drawings conserved by the National Archives of Ireland and made available to us. These are OPW drawings from when the yes, building well, was originally constructed. You know, the records in the building destroyed almost entirely, but these were held separately at the time yeah, and they ironically. survive and are now in the National Archives, the successor to the Public Record Office of Ireland. And yeah, as you say, the very few photographs plus these architectural plans were our route into reconstructing this in yeah. VR. Okay. Let's now go into the through. room itself. Here we are. So where are we now? So this is was then the reading room of the Public Record Office of Ireland. And here you see the desks. Well, first of all, it's got this beautiful coffered ceiling. Again, all that natural light. You'll have seen this in the split that Peter did on the building at the, at the introductory remarks. 
And what we're seeing here to the right is where the archivists sit and where you go to get information on your records that you want to consult. And if you just open that exact hot point there. Yeah, okay. So this will give us this, I think, unique photograph That's right. of yes. the archive as a kind of working reading room. And you know, this was done about 1914. So isn't, isn't that right? So just right, exactly. on the cusp of the yeah, First World War, War yeah. many of the staff uh, went off and fought in that war and some didn't come back. And about eight years before the whole place is destroyed. So, you know, it's, this has seen the, the record office in its mature state, now full, very, very busy, an active part of our, Ireland's kind of uh, intellectual life and uh, public uh, um, utility. Just, yeah. just on, on, on a detail list, we have a minute, Peter, just to show. So yeah, yeah. what you're seeing in the front of the photograph is the public counter and those writing plinths for leaning on. And you can see pens and inkwells where you'd sort of sign in for your day's work. And but even your see, little your little scrap of paper, I presume, yeah. where you put in your notes to get your your record that you're going to look at. Would that be right? they, they're hanging from a nail at the front of the counter, and we've discovered in some of the records we've been dealing with those actual call slips, those dockets. You can see the nail hole been pulled off the corner of the paper, and they've been folded inside as like bookmarks into records. So to, it does the the tangibility of it is very exciting to discover some of those details in our work. Yeah, Kieran is brilliant. I mean, the, the, there's a whole art, I'm a medieval historian, so we don't get many photographs from my period, but there's a whole <laughs> art as a modern historian to reading imagery of this kind and recreating. Uh, but, uh, the, yeah, go on. The, just saying, the guys you can see there, so those two gents to the right, the far right is Herbert Wood, but in, one in from the right is D.A. Chart. So D, David Chart, he studied, he's a Trinity alumnus and um, he's been to a number of universities, but certainly Trinity alumnus for his doctorate. And in the distance in the photograph, you'll see a chap with a bowler hat. Um, uh, so he's one of the staff, but there's a clergyman sitting down reading at a reading desk. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah. so just we'll just note him to the position he's sitting in. We'll meet him later. Yeah, um, that, and you can see, some, oh, those do, drawers actually show about those drawers. Yeah, too. Yeah, the drawers. You can see, I mean, you can get a sense of the living archive. The drawers are open. So flat drawers like that are still used in an archival repository for holding big format, large flat documents, for instance, maps. And we've used details of that kind when we recreated the uh, the VR. Yeah. I also love the boater hat on the hook, which I'm sure yes. must belong to a Trinity crowd. We thought that was a Trinity man right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so where else do I go? So uh, let's look at the far side where the readers were sitting. So if yeah. you go forward and left, please, Peter. Um, so we're walking over to actually to where the clergyman was was sitting there. So he was yeah. on the, the so right you, hand desk there. Orientate yourself. You've now moved over to that corner. We were looking across here at these drawers. And you can see we have drawers now with goodies placed back inside them. Um, so anything like things? that that lights up is, you know, if you we won't click on every one here, but if you click on them, they'll open up full screen for you and you can look at them and engage with them. Um, but does that very first document in front of you, that that uh, where the clergyman was sitting, um, uh, we like to think he might have been looking at this. And there's a reason for why we think this. This is a marriage register from the register for McCroom Parish in County Cork from 1736. And we know that this exact volume was physically in the reading room in 1922 when the anti-treaty forces occupied because uh, it was protected in the strong room which we'll introduce you to now in a moment so here you have like you know tuppers and browns getting married uh beachers and hedges being married in all back in uh 1736 and so this is an original that escaped the flames by sheer happenstance because somebody had been using it the day before the occupation it was put away in the safety deposit box if you like ready for the reader to come back the next morning but the occupation happened in the in the interim um that, so that door, would have been yeah that, that's the door exactly. that everyone's talking about so just imagine this again we're in the reading room we've tried to bring it to life by putting it out you can go and explore them an array of materials that reflect the range of uh, the archive from the middle ages look at the medieval document right there on the desk uh right the way up until the 19th century yeah. including the only irish language documents that were in the building and some of them like this one here we know survived the fire. So they're particularly important materials. Mm. Much of what we have recovered, and we've recovered hundreds of thousands of documents, are copies that are held elsewhere. But there's this unique uh, group of uh, materials that represent uh, the originals that were destroyed in the fire. And some of them were held in that strong room there, which you can see it's got a nice big metal door in it. Can we just show, Kieran? I forgot to show the after image of oh, this. Oh, do, room. yes. Uh, that where I want to there. go. Yeah, yes. so this was the before, remember? And now this is the aftermath of the siege of the four courts. So what that's are we looking at? That's the here? same spot. So what you're looking at there is that's the same location as those two archivists were sitting. We're slightly at a different angle. We're facing the strong room door. Um, and 
the all the furniture has been removed during the occupation what you're seeing in the middle of the photograph is a, a munitions making mill so it's like a um uh, uh, for packing munitions and packing explosives into grenades and mines used by the anti-treaty garrison and what you see there is after the siege and the battle so that's a free state soldier from the pro-treaty side if you like who's standing inside the building once they've taken it back from the anti-treaty forces um, and that's the position that now ironically is where the judge's bench in the court of appeal sits in that building so when you come in the door and look right where the judge's bench is now yeah, is right where, on top of the munitions is right on top of the munitions <laughs> exactly yeah. there yeah. there's um, the open fire if this is why they need yeah. the fire break there's a a tin of what looks like paraffin to me in front of the open fire. I mean, here and I are quite lighthearted about this, but it's because we've been it's using pretty it. tragic, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, what's 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 being shown here is quite remarkable and appalling. That is the strong room door, and mercifully, you can see it's shut. And behind it were still preserved some of the records uh, that were being held out over Easter 1922. This storm is getting wild. I hope you're still receiving us. I hope it's just yeah, a signal going. Lightning. So um, no. the, uh, it's, it feels like the bombardment. Um, we better rush through into the treasury. So yeah. we're now going through into a building that no one alive today has ever been in. And, and this is the tunnel you described. This, this is the fire, fire break tunnel we're going through. Well, and sure. what happens is when you go through in here, we're now in a place that really no one has seen in 100 years. This model that you're seeing, this view that you're seeing would have been first seen in 1867, all those empty shelves, but it's to give you a sense of the sheer scale of the shelves that were filled. This was completely filled by 1912. They were appealing for more space even before those black and white photographs were taken that we showed you earlier. Um, and throughout this space here, you can move around, go up and down the stairs, walk along the different bays, um, but we'll take you on a quick uh, mm -hmm. uh, jump around. Let's teleport I'm, you now. And I'm going to so, leap up to the top of the building. So you, you might feel disoriented for a second, but when I press this button, you'll suddenly be up in the roof space. And here we are. So now you're seeing in detail this ironwork roof, yes. uh, which was completely glazed from one end to the other, allowing this natural light to flood in, which together with the side windows, the arcade on either side, let the workers find the materials in the archive. Now, in a way, that openness, which was integral to the way they were trying to build repository at the time was a great weakness because once fire started, the whole thing was like a great big chimney with, uh, yeah. the, you know, nowadays an archive would always separate the floors and keep everything very isolated. But uh, nonetheless, this is the ironwork that we saw a few minutes ago completely melted uh, in that after image. I'm going to walk the, the, the floor is all about 60 meters long from one end to the other. And we're going to move along using those uh, green sort of navigation spots along on the floor. Yeah. There are also hidden in amongst the shelves here. We have more hotspots, uh, small piece, you know, artwork and stuff oh, yeah. related to the project. But this one, actually, that's very one there you're looking at, Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is an example of some of those salved records. We talked about records that were taken out of the rubble and were carefully parceled away. They've been unparceling those now in the past two years uh, in the National Archives Conservation Lab, funded by the Irish Manuscripts Commission. And um, they have uh, any fragments that fall off the documents when they're working on them, they carefully keep. And so that's an amazing sort of uh, idea of even flag fragments the size of your fingernail get kept because they may add to the story at some point. But what we want to show you now is uh, a, well, we're going to do a, a, a deep dive. So, um, <laughs> yeah, literally. So, so you may feel ill when you watch me do this. But now this is, this yeah. is not normally how we move around, but just for the time constraints we're under here. And then going to back down towards the tile floor. Onto the tile floor. Yeah. And, there and th now this, you have to um, use your imagination here. This is a bit meta. So what we're looking at is we're inside a virtual reality model of the lost building. And we're looking at a doll's house model of that same building. So we're looking at a model while standing inside a model. And the reason for this is you've seen all those open shelves and those bays of records, those bays of shelving, if you like. So three sides of our two sides of a bay of a shelving. Uh, it's hard to get your head around that and to move around the building in its full size. So we've made this doll's house version. And if Peter just sort of clicks on the doll's house, now you'll see it'll open like a book or like a butterfly. Ready? And go. Um, the building itself becomes much more sort of maneuverable and you can look around this is effectively a cabinet of curiosities this is what we've put into i think there's 150 bays here we put in for the centenary 100 chosen objects we have tens of thousands of objects in the repository but we put 100 chosen objects for the 100th anniversary in the different bays as an exhibition and you can sort of uh, plug in and out of these you'll see some are white and most are green the green ones are where there is an active record that you can go in and look at 
And just and moving just to, on so that actually, that's everybody yeah, can, you know, understand yourselves a little bit without getting dizzy that we've, as Kieran says, split this building open on its axis. So it's like a butterfly that's opened from the roost that we came through that tunnel earlier on. So the reading room, the Court of Appeal as it is now, is that uh, end there to the south. And we're looking at this uh, kind of like a schematic. OK, I want to try and maneuver down now. Um, I think we only have time to choose probably two of these. Yeah, do that. I'm going to pick the first one. This is totally selfish. It's uh, just uh -huh. something that I'm interested in as a medievalist. Uh, so you got you can explore any of these you like. The the numbering is from the original. There were six floors from one to six, and then it went around alphabetically from A to is it S or U? Yes, I think. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to go to four R. So four R means I'm on the fourth floor up. And the alphabet has run around from A to R here. Yeah. And when you click on it, it'll swoop you into the bay and you can see deeds from Christchurch Cathedral. And this is, in fact, the case. The uh, Church uh, of Ireland, the established church, established in 1869. Yeah. So the records of uh, the established church started to come into the public record office of Ireland in the 1870s, including, for instance, that parish register we looked at. There were hundreds, there must be thousands of individual thousands, registers yeah. that were destroyed in the fire. Uh, uh, many others survive in the representative church body library out in uh, um, Churchtown. But the oldest records of all came from Christchurch Cathedral, just up the road, as it were, which were accessioned, brought into the record office in the 1870s. And I really like this example because uh, by a, another of these miraculous uh, discoveries, we found that the very earliest record of all, which goes right way back to 1174 mm. or thereabouts, so within uh, only a couple of years, literally, of the first time a King of England comes to Ireland and tries to take Ireland into English control. So that's Henry II, the Plantagenet King, comes to Ireland 1171 to 2 and takes the submission of some of the Irish kings as the era of Strongbow and the Anglo Normans. So it's the beginning of this whole story. And we have this document from that exact moment. And not only do we have the text, we have an image of it. So this occurred because uh, in the 1890s, when the public record office was a living institution, historians were starting to get interested. This is the moment that history becomes a proper discipline. Historians are getting interested in original documents and uh, in their structure, and they're starting to study them closely. The kind of, One of the epicenters of that kind of intellectual work was happening uh, near Trinity at the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland. Uh, and they sent people down to the new public record office, as it was, to do what we would now think of as digitization, was photography yeah. that then get preserved in the Royal Society of Antiquaries collections on glass slides. So it's very um, a stable medium that they created for themselves. And we have then uh, had that digital image of the glass slide uh, brought into our virtual archive for the first time. So there's about three steps there. I probably confused the story a little bit, Kieran. Do you want to? Uh, but, but it, I, and I think it's really cool because like, it well. You, 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 uh, well, to me, you have, but I, yeah, heard <laughs> I've heard it before. <laughs> but the, um, like, it was sought out because it was the oldest record. So people often say, what's the oldest record that we've discovered? Well, this is the oldest record. It was the oldest record that was in the record treasury. They developed this glass slide, this lantern slide, in order to, well, A, to get an image of the document, but B, to tell people at talks and at lectures. And right. here are we, 100 years later, giving yeah. you a talk or a lecture, <laughs> hopefully not a lecture, a tour of the same document that's whatever, you know, almost a thousand years old, processed 100 years ago, a little over 100 years ago, and now a century later or more, we're able to show it again on screen. So it's, it's an amazing testimony to all that the scribe that wrote that back in the Norman era through to the photographer that took it in the 19th century through to the digitization that took place and, in the and, last year or two. And wherever we can, if we can get as close as that to the original materials, it's really, really important. So yeah, this is, in fact, within yeah. medieval studies, a, a yeah. big, a big deal. The world's <laughs> expert on this kind of material is able to look at that handwriting from the glass slide and identify the actual clerk who did the writing in the chancery of the Plantagenet king. So that's, you know, yeah. this is just one example of, you know, a, a extraordinary accumulation. Let, let, let's show my example. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, so does, if this is a king dealing with a large institution like a, a medieval abbey, 
Yeah. There's, if we look now at an example of something from, from more towards my period into the modern, uh, well, post Union Ireland. So if you go to it's six uh, N, please. Um, and yeah, we're going into yeah. this one here. So just just to briefly, so this is local government records. And we're looking here at the, before the county councils, you had grand juries and the grand jury county Mayo has its records here. And these are maps. So if you just click into this one, please, Peter, these are uh, sheet maps. So they're like 24 sheets covering the entire county, but there's one sheet here that just in preparation for this talk, I was looking for something that might be an interesting story. And in sheet 11 here, this is Ackle Island. So if we zoom in on this point in Ackle Island, this is a very detailed grand jury map before there was an Ordnance Survey of Ireland. This is from 1830. And if you're just zooming in on Schlievemore Mountain here, just above the word Ackle, and if you just strike slightly down, if you zoom in as tight as you can, Peter, on that, thank you very much. Do you see the little black dots, the little ants above the word Tower Moor or Tubber Moor here? All those little black dots are individual cabins. It's like a long stringy village or settlement. I counted about 50 little cabins. That, if you're familiar with Mayo and Ackle and its story, that is the deserted village or the famine village on Ackle Island. And I'm pretty sure I've been lining up the maps this morning and I'm pretty sure it's the right thing. Um, this is a, a, that 15 years later, this gets overwhelmed by famine. It, the population either uh, die or move. <clears throat> and these uh, set of stone buildings are left open and roofless. But it's an idea of local government and ordinary people on the ground, real living people on the, failing to live on the ground during famine conditions. So the stories come right along from the, the medieval records being shown by, by Peter on that. So this is you can dip into all of these bays yourselves and, ha and have a, a good look around. Um, I think that's an important point. I, yeah, we often get this. So what actually is in there that tells us about Ireland? This is the, mm. the archive of the English government. And our, you know, that's not really the way to think about it. Although this was, it's true, the archive of English administration in Ireland from the earliest point right the way up to the 19th century. What it reveals is the story of Ireland across the entire island and uh, uh, an incredible detail for social history and uh, everyday yeah, life, absolutely. as well as elite history and institutions. OK, this, well, on, on the topic of institutions. Yeah, in, exactly. In that's home, <clears throat> so when you come to the virtual tragedy, this is what you'll see. I just think put in a word that's meaningful for you, a place or a family is the place to start with it and just see what you get as a return. But we pre-populated one. This is like Blue Peter. And what have we got here? Kira? We search for College Green. So we're bringing it right back home to Trinity. So we're standing at the front of Front Arch, looking out on College Green. And this is the search results we get. So we just like this as an array. You've got nice colored images, the molten images. You've got um, city surveyor maps of College Green and the roads off it. And then a mix of both printed documents and handwritten manuscript documents stretching over quite a wide date range here. And you can dip in. I mean, there's almost 40 different hits just for the word College Green. And you can dip into any of these and, and hunt around in them. So we'll just quickly show you one example here so if you click to the actual document in, in the viewer you'll see the i mean this if you can read handwriting this gives you it is searchable these have all been transcribed <clears throat> and you can hunt within a document or read it uh, and the transcription down there is uh, in most cases is machine produced transcription that's a story we can talk about in the q a at the end we'd urge you to go into the vr model have a hunt around and go to the treasury itself and have a hunt around yourselves on the you know search for a name for whatever you think is of interest to you we don't know all that is in it. There's over 50 million transcribed words, so please have at it. And if you find something uh, uh, exciting or new, tell all your friends. <laughs> 50 million words and counting. Okay. And counting, and counting. Future. Okay, thanks so, very much indeed. I'll stop there. Super, we'll hand back to, to Kira. Thanks very much, Peter. Hi guys, that was fantastic. That was so, so good. We're now back in the rain, as Kieran says, out of the virtual treasury now. <laughs> um, I just want to start with like how interesting at the start to hear how many precautions they took to really fireproof the building. When you hear 1867, I ignorantly go, well, they probably never thought a fire was going to, or never even thought of a fire. And all of my history teachers throughout would always joke, you know, not the four courts, but it really makes it so devastating when you hear that they actually did take such precautions about fire for it to yeah, really, yeah. It, that must have been absolutely awful. And as, as historians yourself, you can probably really, really empathize. Well, it was a very big topic uh, officially because in, is it 1834 that the old Westminster Palace burns down? almost completely. And it burns down because they're throwing medieval records, actually wooden records, onto a furnace down beneath the uh, uh, old palace of Westminster. And this becomes a, a very famous event that's often reproduced. And it just brings home to them that they have to look after records. So it's at exactly the same time in the 1830s that they're trying to create the first public record office in England. 
and our one comes 30 years afterwards. So that, that's all very interconnected in that sense. They're learning one lesson from another. But yeah. they're, they're very conscious. I mean, fires are a constant risk for archives. But even down to, like, when you read through the records, as I've had the pleasure of doing, read through the records of the institution itself, they're looking at uh, impregnated cardboard with chemicals to make it fire resistant. So they can make cardboard boxes to hold records uh, where the cardboard is, is particularly dense and is impregnated with various kinds of substances to make it at least fire retardant. And they're experimenting within the archival building itself to make the most fireproof stuff. And then you hear, you read tragic lines like um, they have installed, was it, I think, three fire extinguishers? I mean, and, and a number of buckets and a number of buckets <laughs> just for building that size and they yeah. felt that that was <laughs> yeah gosh it's fantastic yeah. it's just it's unbelievable I, I would never even think that myself but it, it was so mm. interesting at the start to hear you say that and how the inferno bent in on itself it's just it's heartbreaking but it amazing that you guys so um so many years after get to uncover these little christmas packets of uh, you so nicely said they were co covered in cotton and paper so each one of those must have been like a little present for each of you so can I just ask like what was the most interesting or exciting I know you took us through a few there each of you which was the most interesting or exciting piece that you uncovered on Christmas day um, I, I'm, well, I'll do, there's one that I am um, on my <laughs> archive of Christmas and um, we were we've worked, worked with many different archives state archives and also some quite small archives we worked with the Irish Capuchin Friars archive on Church Street and the Capuchin Friars for people who might know it, it's the I think it's a Lady of the Angels church it faces the forecourse practically on Church mm. Street and back in about 1919 they were putting together a case for one of the friars to be made in one of the friars from centuries earlier to be canonized as a saint in the Catholic Church. And to make the case, they had to write up a history of his life and that he died for the faith and he died on the Cromwellian era. So they went into the record office across the road and found the record, which was the priest hunter who'd caught this priest and handed him over to the authorities. And then he subsequently died as a result of his, of his treatment. But they found the receipt for sort of a five pounds reward for finding a priest. And they took a photograph of that page the building, the page, the volume all burnt, but the photograph remained in the Capuchin Friars. And it's only the top half of one page of an entire collection. But to find a photograph, like we think of taking photographs in an archive so automatically now, but in 1919, it was a very new thing to do. And it's part of this completely, we never thought for a moment the idea of causes for sainthood as being a way of finding things. It's one, it's one stitch, but one stitch in a huge tapestry. But I just, to see that photograph just gave me kind of chills to think that's the only image of all that entire collection is gone. We Nothing from that survived, you know? That's that unbelievable. Yeah. That's fantastic. Gosh, and Peter, what, what would be your favourite? Yeah, it's very hard to pick, but I, I <laughs> like I your do, children, you know. <laughs> yeah, I do have this memories that will always stay with me of having the privilege of standing in the National Archives Ireland with our colleague Zoe Reed, who's the conservator, and opening brown parcels just as you described them for the first time, and you could still smell the the smoke and the ash from the records. It's incredibly evocative. Yeah. And they're not all, I mean, there are these the desperately sad fragmentary pieces, but some of them have come through the uh, blaze in the most miraculous format. So we a, a big vein of our work was to work with uh, the parallel sets of materials that are in London, duplicates that were made and sent across, and that, that's given us a lot of content. But in, the parallels mostly were destroyed in um, uh, 1922 in Dublin, but there have been these few original materials that have survived almost intact and I was there at the unboxing of some of them and uh, it's just you know it's going to be a long process as they're slowly yeah. made less brittle and handleable and so on but because parchment is such a stable medium much more stable than paper older medium it's skin you know it's, it's, it's sheep skin mostly it becomes very brittle in the heat but it's stable and so when it's rehumidified and flattened out we're now able to look at these documents and they're as they were, or maybe cleaner than when they were first written 700 years ago. It's quite extraordinary. It's and uh, amazing. Yeah. That's, that's so interesting. And it's so interesting because it, it, it transfers so much, like even how Jonathan Swift's writings in the 1700s are more preservable than Samuel Beckett's in the, in the 70s. Like they're going to be gone in a few years. Like that's absolutely it, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So yeah. that preservation part is just yeah. so interesting. And it, it actually comes back to like that part you were saying about the fingernail pieces of the the burnt yes, um, yes. documents and how you still have those piecing all of those together and um, how do you think like you know, and Peter you were saying there about how evocative the smell of yeah. I guess the fire was uh how can we put this in the context of um how good or you know bad a virtual record treasury is 
Um, you know, is there something to be said for the physical or the, oh, yeah. the virtual? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What? What? Well, what actually, it's interesting. Know? I mean, we aren't the only digital project in the world. I think we're quite unusual in using virtual and digital mechanisms to reconstruct something that's been lost and the, the sort of bringing together of different repositories into one new thing is a, a new mixing and that's why we like the word treasury but everywhere the experience has been that the creation of digital materials like this doesn't make the artifacts you know irrelevant or redundant and yeah. so on it's a complete misunderstanding mm -hmm. in fact it's bringing students much closer to manuscripts than when i was studying 20 years ago when we tended to use the printed editions my students now are immediately connecting with the manuscript culture in a way that's uh, uh just wasn't possible because you couldn't give people access so i think in a in a way one thing i hope that's happening even though we're a virtual project is we really raise the profile of yeah. the physical uh, remains and uh, conservation as a practice has really sort of shown its worth through the centenary and it's something that I think we can continue to pursue uh, in the years after yeah. uh, 2022. Yeah. Absolutely uh, and, my, and my final little question to you both is um, you both are chasing down documents all over the world uh, you're running around in archives in exotic locations the only thing that's missing is bad guys um, because you're Indiana Jones and <laughs> as another alumni put it um, 007 um, I'll let you two choose which one you are. But um, my question to you was, what was it like to work with people all around the world and collaborate on such projects? Well, can I say first, both Indiana Jones and 007, you know, as nice as an idea as that is, seem to cause incredible destruction. <laughs> 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 Explosions. <laughs> Explosions. <laughs> Wherever they've been, that's, that's not how we tend to do our work. <laughs> Thankfully, yes. Uh, we do wear tuxedos all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just not uh, today. <laughs> Well, I mean, we it has. I mean, we were working for a couple of years in pandemic uh, uh, mm. circumstances, so that that was tricky. But that's where the generosity of the partners really shone through. So we were working with American institutions, for instance, who weren't dealing with readers because they were closed, but they were still engaged with their own collections, and they were very generous in doing digitalization work and sharing it with us, so we could share it on digitally. But when we could get out into the archives. I mean, I think for me as a medievalist, it was very exciting to go to uh, Westminster Palace, which you have, everybody will have seen the Queen lying in state recently in the Great Hall of Westminster built in the 1390s. That hall was a medieval uh, archive of sorts. It's where the Exchequer sat and Irish materials from Dublin Castle were sent annually or near annually across to that hall. And there they were audited and preserved in the areas around it. And it really kind of uh, brought past and present together in a very direct way uh, that these you know the the legacy of the institutions that go back centuries is still very present in uh, our, our, uh, our our record heritage and also the interconnections they may have frayed a little bit in recent politics but the the historic connections and the archival connections are are you know uh, there to be explored yeah great Kieran do you have anything to add to that I, I, I'm <clears throat> I, I think of, of favorite places to have worked or that that idea of collaborating with people i think going to places like for instance marsh's library in dublin um and just describing the project to people there and the archivist there and uh, jason and so forth that and people think right i'm not sure if we have anything for you and then they think about it and they come back after a few days and say oh we do have this collection maybe you can look at this and going into their rooms and finding on shelves records that had been transcribed you know in 1915 or 1900 in the four courts in the public record office and then were shelved in marshes and they were only a copy when the four courts burns down and the public record office is lost the only copy becomes the only copy and its nature somehow changed and see archivists themselves getting so pleased and excited about their collections when they realize that they got the only copy of something it's it's sort yeah. of a, a, a extra value to it or not that they don't value them but it sort of becomes a, a more yeah, significant well, I, think they, yeah. I think it, i think the whole question of uh you know how do you reconstruct has been an invitation for many institutions yeah. to revisit collections that just weren't as uh, significant a priority or at least if they were important locally you couldn't see what they could connect with to make them yes. even more important yeah, the connection the connectivity important. that really yeah. elevates the whole enterprise i think it's so lovely. It's so nice to hear. Thank you so much for chatting us through. If I've learned anything from today, it's that we should all be locked in a room for an hour and forced to come up with an idea more often <laughs> if things like this come out of it. So without further ado, we'll go on to the audience q and um, I think we have quite a few questions up here. Um, a lot of brilliant comments from you, a lot of brilliant jobs. Thank you. Everyone is just so excited about the tour. Thanks, folks. Um, I have a question here. 
um, that I'm going to ask you, which is as best as you can estimate, what percentage or proportion of the lost records are being recovered via this project roughly, excluding mm -hmm. those records that accidentally survived the fire due to being in the reading room or elsewhere? Very specific from, from Jared there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I, I mean, I don't want to be evasive, but it's actually quite hard to give a, a single percentage. Uh, and I think what we, achieved for the centenary was really significant in terms of the quantity like for the, it's always been the thing I've been saying it's a quite problem of scale not of uh, lack of records uh, so the the millions of words of content that we've managed to make searchable and so on is a huge uh, achievement and there's much more of that to come it becomes more meaningful when we answer at specific uh, collections that we know very well so we identified three we call them gold seams for the centenary where we knew that we could reconstruct a whole series of material, not so sort of a bit of a document here and a bit of a document there, but an entire archival series in full or nearly in full. Uh, and once we're at that level, I mean, sometimes we're getting over 80% for those series. And the reason we get 80% and more is because they were actively investigated in the centuries before the fire, not just in the life of the public record office, but sometimes uh, much further back, yeah. or they were duplicated by the state because they were considered of real significance. So sometimes we can get 100% of the whole series. In the case of the 1766 census that we uh, platformed, my colleague Brian Gurren uh, uh, was the kind of uh, frontiers man on that. Uh, that's a nice example because it takes us right the way through the story from salved material that's material that comes through the fire and miraculously survives to uh transcription and materials that won't be recovered there were 800 census returns for 1766 that's ireland's first census and only 58 i think so it's about seven percent if my math is right only 58 came through the fire and about 55 percent something like that, of the total has been recovered uh, to date. So that's a huge jump from the tiny amount that came through the fire to the total. Support is now known. Yeah, yeah. And tens of thousands of names yeah. have been generated from that census. We can't always achieve that level of yeah. uh, success, but there are very, very encouraging stories. They were just the three we were able to do in practical terms uh, for the centenary. When documents just simply weren't copied before the fire, there's very little we can do. And when documents were destroyed before the Public Record Office could get around to creating its own indexes, uh, that's where we get really sad uh, stories. So the census of the 19th century, the second half of the 19th century, is one of the great tragedies. It's just a, a fact of it. But they were not destroyed in the fire. That's the thing that is mostly misunderstood. They were destroyed by government decision, uh, I think, to create paper. Is that true? Yeah, Karen? create paper pulp. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even policy, yeah. And the Public Record Office of Ireland objected at the time and said this is madness. Uh, yeah. But the, you know, at an official level, they weren't interested in the very thing everybody wants now, which is the names, the nominal record, content yeah, of the yeah. census. Yeah. However, we'll do everything we can to uh, reconstruct uh, uh, portions of the, of the yeah, census. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. I have another um, question here, which is, um, were there any documents that you recovered that were in Irish? Yeah, actually, if you go yeah. back into the reading room, <clears throat> Uh, yeah. yeah, so imagine where we were a few minutes ago and the archivists were on the right hand side and on the left, you walked over and looked at the McCroom register. Well, just before you walked around the corner, there was a, a sort of uh, a plinth and there was a document sitting on it and we placed on the plinth the only Irish documents. I mean, across the whole hundred you know, thousand square feet or whatever it was of shelving, uh, the Public Record Office of Ireland uh, knew that they had this very, very thin slice of Irish material. So that's Irish language material. It's not that Irish people aren't recorded in the records, it's just the, the medium through which the records yeah. were written was either in the earliest days, Latin, later French used in uh, Parliament, later on mostly English. These documents themselves though were fascinating uh, and they were published by the uh, Public Record Office in 1897 in the old print, you know, the Shanklo and uh, they were translated. So they're available. There's five of those, records. yeah, five documents. Five yeah. of them from the, kind of the late 16th and 17th century. Yeah, yeah. And one of them actually talks about, uh, it's a Breton law arbitration. Yeah, that's they say that's they're true. setting yeah. down the Breton law judgment in writing, quote unquote, for fear of oblivion, because they say, uh, writing is better than memory. And this is kind of a very interesting moment when Ironic, the, kind yeah. of the tradition of Breton law and the kind of written legal tradition is uh, abutting each other. 
that's fantastic. Um, I, my final question to you both is, um, what was each of yours most um, beautiful or interesting archive that you visited? Which one did really took your breath away? Oh, I'll have to <laughs> go for one which is unexpected. So um, we're close colleagues with the National Archives in the United Kingdom in Kew outside London, and they've got vast storage, but for their even vaster collections that aren't regularly consulted, they store them down a salt mine in the countryside in England and I got a chance to go down the salt mine and visit their record collections underground and I thought I was going down a mine <laughs> where you'd have to duck your head but in fact you go down in the lift shaft and there are large um what have you, you know a, a New Holland tractors driving around pulling containers of, of records behind them we went down in the minibus underground but we had a fantastic visit just to to see the scale of record keeping and that's lots of big western nations keeping records in these vast industrial sort of scale uh, storage facilities but going down a mine to consult records was my standout memory for this part of the, of the journey all right for sure <laughs> yeah i think tcd library sorry to uh, be local about it but... <laughs> no we love but it here <laughs> it's not a bad uh, reading room uh, and it's obviously being refurbished in the next couple of years and that'll be exciting um but I would give a plug maybe to Public Record Office Northern Ireland that people mightn't know because yeah. it's brand new. It, I, I actually didn't know this, but the first time I visited it in 2011, June, it had opened a couple of weeks before. Uh, and it is still feels like a, a you know, a, a, a really complex, wonderful yeah, space. Yeah. You walk in and there is this fantastic atrium that, to my mind, I'm not sure if this is on purpose, but it recalls that atrium of the record treasury. It's down in Titanic Quarter. Uh, they're really, really helpful and they've been fabulous partners. We haven't mentioned oh, them yet. But D.H. Arch, who we mentioned as the Trinity alum, the, uh, the one in the photograph, yes. he mm -hmm. was the first deputy keeper of Public Record Office Northern Ireland. So it was founded just after the fire in 1923. He moved from Dublin North to Belfast in 1923. He wrote the legislation that created the Public Record Office Northern Ireland. So there's a nice connection there and it remains a really important uh, and uh, very generous institution. That's lovely. That's so yeah. nice. And and Kieran, you're not convincing me any less that you're not Indiana Jones going down salt mines in, <laughs> in little carriages. Like um, I think we have time for just one more question um, from Vivian. Um, just about the source. I think you guys have already gone over this, but maybe about the sources of the duplicate records. How did you know there yes. were duplicates? And yep. did the sources have other records of interest that shows to be included eventually in the project? Yeah, that's a really important question. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, our first priority when we would select things for prioritization in for the centenary had to be the things that were the most immediately connected to the public record office itself the direct copies sometimes we knew there were copies because they're they're literally were the office files of the public record office that survived the fire because they were at the front of the building so they would have been working on projects to um they call it calendaring to, to translate or uh index records and a huge amount of that material survives and we've been working through it and a significant amount was already digitized and there's lots more of it that we'd like to pursue in the future um but you're right to touch on this point what happens when you just go one layer beyond that it might be not a direct copy but it's the other half of the correspondence so yeah. one half of correspondence is lost the other half lies with the say the private individual or the, another archive and so it's very closely connected and i think there we just have to make good decisions about how do we get us yeah. as close to records that were destroyed as possible um, and I mean, it happens through, Kieran and I are talking, but we have a significant team uh, yes. whose work this is, sure. uh, and we work with now nearly, it's over 70, isn't it, archival partners who have the record specialism. Yeah. So uh, you know, America, that, yeah. that kind of um, provenance uh, uh, work happens through the very careful historical training and archival expertise, yeah. Yeah. and we try and be as careful as possible. Fantastic. Well, Indiana Jones and 007, I mean, Peter and Kieran, thank you so much for having us today and um, for a fantastic virtual tour. It was so hard to even see questions because there were so many, like so many positive comments there in the comment oh, section. Everyone really thank enjoyed it. So uh, thank you very much for joining us and for being so generous with your time and expertise this afternoon. Um, sure. Thank you. Thank you. So if you would like to continue exploring the Virtual Treasury and keep up to date with their latest discoveries, you can go to the Virtual Treasury of Ireland website, which is www.virtualtreasury.ie. Uh, the Virtual Treasury is also on Facebook and Twitter as well. I'd also like to thank my colleagues in the alumni office for today's webinar, especially Mr. Mark Deering for all the technical support and putting it together. And thank you as well to everyone here who attended and shared your questions. It's been fantastic to have your engagement as always. And I really hope you'll join us next time for our next webinar series.
So our next webinar series is going to be with Ema Noonan and Pisha Whelan. It's going to be behind the music and it's all about conductor stories. So we'll see you next time on Wednesday, the 23rd of November at the later time of 7 p.m. And in the meantime, if you have any questions or comments, please, please email us at alumni at tcd.ie. Thank you again for joining us. We'll really hope to see you again. Gurma Haggad.